Hello again. I'm so glad to be joined for another week of updates featuring Ron Davis. Today we're going to be talking about something very exciting. It's called the Manganese Grant. And this is a project that is being worked on by both Ron Davis, who is joining us today, with Janet Defoe, and Laurel Crosby, who is another researcher who is working alongside of Ron. They're putting enormous amount of effort into this project. So today, Janet is going to be leading us through an interview where we get into the details of this grant and the study. Thank you, Janet, and thank you, Ron. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you again. So the second thing that Ron Davis is really excited about is this manganese grant, which they've just received. Um, and they actually had the money delivered to Stanford, which is why they waited to announce it to make sure they actually got the money. And it's from the Department of Defense. And it's for $1.6 million over a period of three years. So this is really going to enable them to do some good work. So why don't you tell us about the manganese grant and why this is so exciting to you? Well, it's been an observation that we've made a number of years ago uh, when we were collecting hair samples from patients and analyzing their metal, uh, the metals that they had in them. And some of this started with the idea, maybe they have uh, heavy metals like cadmium that are causing a problem and that would show up in the hair. And this is really Laurel this going is, for hair, right? Yeah, because Laurel has been trained as a uh, uh, a, a civil civil engineer, and that's one thing that civil engineers do work about worry about the environment. So she knows all about that and the and the mass spectrometries that use that are used to, to analyze it. So it's interesting because a lot of people poo poo getting data from hair, but Laurel has been very persistent and has found interesting yeah. things using hair. So we're not giving up on that, right? No, and, and you have to worry about uh, environmental contamination. Uh, but in some cases, if you've got environmental con contamination, you, know, you, you might worry about it. Like uh, we found a couple of patients that had uranium, radioactive uranium. Um, in their hair? In their hair. And so uh, th that was of concern. And the other thing you can do is to take a piece of a, a small amount of hair and cut it up into one inch pieces. And that's a clock because your hair grows out. So you can, you can go back and figure out when uh, the contamination may have occurred. In the case of the uranium, it was over many, many, many years. And it turned out it was, uh, they were using well water and the well was contaminated with uranium. And they stopped and it and went away. Stopped, and they stopped. And uh, so th that was a really useful thing to discover. Uh, so you can find the metals. And one thing that we observed with the uh, patients, uh, it was also very easy to do because a patient can clip a little hair, put it in a plastic bag and send it to us. Very cheap. And you also have to make sure you don't have zinc in your shampoo, right? Yeah. You, and then if you, uh, if you see a lot of zinc, you have to worry about that. That's probably from shampoo. Uh, and so we didn't really look at zinc uh, very much because of that. Uh, but one thing we did notice that uh, mang of all the metals, uh, manganese was one of the lowest. The next lowest was copper. And so uh, these are essential metals that are involved with enzymes. That is, they are part of an enzyme and they're essential in the enzyme for the enzyme to actually function. And you're talking about in patients' hair now, right? This is in patients' hair. Of course, we did some healthy people as well, and there's a lot of data on what, what, what's in hair of healthy people. So it's all compared to them. And then uh, it's also, uh, we have some indicators as to what, what level is there that where it is likely to cause uh, reduction in enzymatic activity. And in these cases, the patients with copper and manganese and, and frequently iron um, uh, were, well, were, were very low in the sense that they, they were likely having a problem. We then, uh, with the local people, when we did the hair sample, we did blood and looked at the blood and it wasn't, it wasn't quite consistent. So sometimes the patients had a normal level in their blood and though their hair was low. So it, it's a little bit of a perplexing problem. Uh, now the hair comes from cells. 
So uh, even though there can be a contamination problem, it is coming from cells. It's important that the manganese get into cells. So if you can find it in your blood, it doesn't mean it's in the cell. It has to get transported into the cell. For you to be healthy, you mean? Right. Well, in fact, uh, where we're looking at it and uh, of interest is that uh, it's involved in a number of enzymes in the mitochondria. One of them uh, is an enzyme that's uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the glycolysis pathway uh, of starting to burn glucose, which we know glucose is not used very well. That could be why. So, um, uh, so you're saying if, the, if your manganese is low, you might not be able to burn glucose very well. That's correct. Which we know is true for right. MACFS right. patients. Now, um, we have been trying to get some funding at NIH for the manganese project without success. Uh, Vinod Kostla helps support uh, at low level all, all this preliminary data for the manganese uh, to, for us to continue to explore it. And um, what we would like to do then is to make sure that the, is the manganese uh, in the cell is the manganese in the mitochondria, because it's going to have to get transported uh, into into the. It's going to have to get digested, transported from the gut into the blood, from the blood to the cell, from the cell to the mitochondria. It can get blocked at any one of those levels. It's got to be in the mitochondria for it to be functioning properly. So uh, the, the plan is, in fact, then to actually run enzymatic activities of cells and, and uh, look at uh, these enzymes that are in the mitochondria and see if they're functioning at a normal level. And then add manganese to them and see if they increase activity. Uh, now, we've also noticed that there are a number of very important enzymes in this in the what's called the urea cycle. That, not may, it, that may not sound very exciting to people, <laughs> but uh, um, when you burn amino acids, which the patients are doing, and, and they are probably, uh, uh, that's where some of their, maybe a lot of their energy is coming from, then you have to get rid of the nitrogen that's in the, in the amino acid. And that nitrogen is eliminated in the urea cycle. So that's a very important cycle probably for the patients. Uh, and it's also very important that you, uh, you don't allow ammonia to be made because ammonia is very toxic. And so that's another issue. We've been trying to measure the ammonia adequately, but it's, we haven't succeeded. In does, much, does ammonia have to do with the nitrogen? Well, yeah, the, the, the nitrogen can get converted to ammonia and the, and the urea cycle is involved in that detoxification so that it in fact goes off as urea because urea has- You mean a, it gets eliminated as your- As urea, and it's, urea has a lot of nitrogen in it. So you've got to get rid of the nitrogen and not allow it to go off as ammonia because then you'll be suffering from the toxicity. So uh, we're going to track this, uh, all these different enzymes that are the copper and manganese and so forth. We're calling it the manganese project because that's where we're focused. But we'll look at the other metals and we'll also look at uh, how their transport is. Is selenium involved in this too? No, but selenium is another important one because it's involved in oxidative uh, repair and blocking oxidative damage, which also appears to be in patients. So uh, selenium is another one of the, of, of the, of the and that's a non-metal. Are you looking at it with this grant? Uh, we probably will, but not, maybe not very extensively because we will be focused on, initially we'll be focused on manganese. The nice thing about this grant is for three years. And so uh, we, we'll have a, a, a long time to plan out experiments and so forth and, uh, and allow us to uh, look into other, other aspects. Uh, all these uh, metals and, and selenium are actually very easy to supplement. You can buy uh, at your local pharmacy all these different metals, and they're not very expensive. But you should not be taking them just because you might be low in them. You really need to have an assay. And why is that? Because at high levels are very toxic. So it's dangerous to 
try to supplement unless you are actually monitoring right. the levels and is monitoring in the blood the place where you would monitor well i think that's how everybody does it um i i you probably don't want to try to monitor it in the hair because it takes maybe too long for the hair to grow uh, what about monitoring it in urine I, I, I it, that can be done, but I don't know very much about the area, about, about urine monitoring. I think most of the physicians monitor in the blood. <clears throat> but this, you need to be, if you're going to take these supplements, you need to be under a, a medical care uh, so that uh, you don't make a mistake because all of these metals are toxic in, in too high amounts. So this sounds exciting. Maybe you could just say clearly how low manganese could affect the health and symptoms of the patients. Well, it will, it, it will really affect your ability to burn glucose, which is a major source of, uh, of fuel that the body uses. It will also affect how you can eliminate the nitrogen and, and the, uh, the, the urea uh, cycle. And so there are indications that in both of these cycles, there's a problem. So it's a matter of us uh, going in and doing some old fashioned hardcore biochemistry, which is what I am. <laughs> um, You're hardcore. Yes. <laughs> and I believe in data and not, uh, and not guesswork. So you said to me that you thought manganese may be at the very core of what's going on here. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, because it's involved in so many of the enzymes that we know are a problem. And is so, it related to the attaconate? Well, uh, it's thing. It could be. Um, but also the other thing uh, that we have looked at, uh, and I won't get into that at the moment, but also BH4 because that is also related to some of these. And we'll probably uh, try to get some funding to do uh, an extension into BH4 as well. Well, that'll be a different video. Well, yeah, we haven't even started any work on that, but, but it, it, it intersects in this pathway and that's the important thing. Um, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's exciting because uh, this would be so easily corrected if, if it's true. And uh, uh, and the thing is, is, it's about transport. So also the urea cycle is involved in the making of spermine and spermidine. Now, what's interesting about those is that there was a recent publication that indicated spermine and spermidine were involved uh, in uh, uh, their levels were important when they got mononucleosis to coming down with MECFS. In other words, this is what was before the viral infection. They had too low or too high a level. So that though were, the spermine was one of the, the, the top candidate for why you might get MECFS if you got a viral infection. You mean having too hot, too much spermidine? Too, spermine, uh, and then and the, and the spermidine was, was too low. It's, it's really interesting. Um, now, both spermine and spermidine uh, can block ion channels like the calcium channel, but it could also block how man things like manganese get in. So right. you're going to be able to explore all these pathways because you've got this nice big grant. Right. I know you're also excited about this because you're going to be able to do extensive biochemistry and metabolite and genetic work. Well, the, the, um, the, can you a, talk about that just well, a little the, bit? Yeah, there's what we have often done because we're so stripped for scrapped for funds is that we look at five or ten patients uh, to, and try to make conclusions on that. It'd be much better to do more, but it, co it costs too much money. So uh, with this grant, uh, we'll have the money to do uh, like a hundred. So we will start collecting samples from, uh, a, 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 and we'll work on how we actually go about doing that. We'd like to do this without uh, sending a mobile phlebotomist and spending that money, but uh, use some kind of, uh, th th there's a company we've been working with locally that does a little device putting on your arm to collect blood. So you can then collect blood and then maybe send it to us. So it would be very cheap for the patients, no personal interaction. You can do it at home. 
So we're trying to make streamline this in the way that make it a, a lot better. Laurel's been working on this for a couple of years. Uh, so watch for Laurel to send out a request for help to get subjects to maybe wear this device, or if that doesn't work out, come in and donate blood. Also, for there's this project. Yeah, there's uh, th there are several other metabolites that are are not uh, seen in the mass spectrometry experiments, the metabolomics that is done, and they've never been looked at. Uh, uh, but so um, Mike Jensen, who works in the lab, has worked out an assay on his uh, 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 electrophoresis is uh, HPLC instrument. And that HPLC instrument was, was purchased by funds from the Open Medicine Foundation with a special gift for Whitney's uh, birthday. And people- oh, his, his fundraiser. His, his personal fundraiser raised the money for that. And now we can do this assay. And uh, I, it's kind of exciting because we don't know what we're going to find. Nobody has looked at these compounds, these metabolites, and they're really central in terms of uh, as regulation. You talk back to manganese, right? Yeah, the manganese and the mangan okay. manganese, right? Um, and they're, they're, they regulate spermine and spermidine. So it's exciting that we might discover something really important. Okay, so yeah. I've never heard of spermidine or spermine before. So can you just tell me if it's related to sperm in any way? Uh, yes, it is. That's where it comes from. Uh huh. So uh, spermine and spermidine are have a lot of nitrogen, and the nitrogen has a positive charge. And when you make sperm, uh, you have to combat. You have to compact the DNA into a small little particle. And uh, that's done with the spermine and spermidine. And so it's in part, it's, it's a major component of sperm, but it's used throughout the body for other purposes. That's interesting. Okay, well, I just thought I'd, I figured a lot of people were wondering that, so I might as well ask. <laughs> well, there's another one that's made in the same pathways, it's called putrescine. And you might guess what that smells like. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I, have, we, have you covered everything that you're excited about with the manganese grant? Well, I think so. Uh, without going into incredible detail, which I think you don't need to see, uh, but I'm excited about it. it. It really might uncover some really important things. And I love getting into where we can look at things that nobody's ever looked at before. Um, because then you're, it, 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 you know, you're exploring now. And, uh, and, but you know that it has potential for answers for CFS. That's right. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, thank you. if you're excited about this research and want to donate to help get more funds, you can donate to omf.ngo and uh, specify that it's for Ron Davis, or you can donate directly to Ron at the Stanford Genome Center um, at Stanford which is easy to Google and it will go directly to his research. And we really are grateful to Vinod and uh, for the initial funding for this and for the grant from the Department of Defense. Finally, after writing 24 grants, he's gotten a grant. <laughs> it's wonderful. And, and uh, Laurel has just really, really worked hard on this. I hear them talking on the phone about it, you know, three times a week and working it all out and planning it. And yeah, and she's and, just submitted another grant. And she wrote the grant and it's, you know, it got really good reviews. So we're excited. And the, okay. And the new yeah, thank you so much for explaining that more. And we, we will share updates about this grant as they come out. And we're really excited. I hope this makes everyone watching feel really hopeful about the progress and exciting things that are going on in Stanford. So thanks again for joining me today and stay tuned as we'll be sharing more updates from Ron every week. Thank you. Thanks.